we've been looking forward to this for a long time. I've been complaining for many, many years that there's not a lot of attention to cost effectiveness, benefit cost studies, and there's not a lot of training in it. If you look around the country and you look at evaluation programs in all of the areas reflected in the presentations of, of uh, your activities, there's very little going on in terms of training people. If you pick up uh, evaluation methods books, it's almost, in fact, sometimes you can't even find cost in the index at the end. And this is particularly surprising in retrospect to an economist because uh, economists have been focusing on effects and on identification of causal relationships, all kinds of things, but ultimately economics is about the allocation of scarce resources and it's not just a matter of effects, it's also a matter of costs, relative effects, relative costs. Um, so in a, in a sense, it's somewhat surprising that so little attention has been devoted, particularly to training people who do work in evaluation on uh, a neglect on the cost side, okay? Um, I'm gonna welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. We had uh, somewhere between 70 and 80 applications for this first round. We are going to be doing six of these all together. So what that tells you is you're guinea pigs, but we're also guinea pigs. And when you see the video uh, stuff, that's really not for a summative evaluation of what we're doing, but it's so that we can learn. And as part of that, I have to uh, ask you to give us feedback, okay? Uh, it doesn't have to, it, it doesn't have to, it has to be constructive, of course, because we're all persuaded more by constructive feedback. But we know that there will be challenges and we would like your suggestions. Indeed, if you have good examples in your own work that you think we, we ought to consider when we present material, we're very open to that, okay? Um, Brooks left something out. Uh, she's also our director of training. I always tell her, you're my boss. And uh, she, she's so modest, she didn't mention that, that she's responsible. So she would be the key person to communicate with for feedback. And, and we sincerely want feedback on what we're doing because we'd like to uh, learn something. And I hate to say this, but do it a better job on the next one and on the next one and on the next one and so on. Um, thanks for enduring the weather. We didn't have much control over that, but uh, I know it took some effort. And uh, as Brooks mentioned, we will have people coming in later in the week. Let, let me just mention that, that the team that we have here, uh, with the exception of Meredith, who's been with us just for a few months, and she's, it's been, my experience, it's been uh, one in which I view her as having been with us for 10 years. But everyone has been with us, I would say, for four to five years or longer. Uh, Clive Belfield, whom you'll meet later today, I believe, um, has been with us for 15 years. And although he's a uh, professor of economics at the City University, in fact, he spends most of his time here. And uh, we, we work together. Patrick McEwen was a graduate student of mine way back in the 90s uh, at Stanford. And um, he's the co-author of the second edition, the, the version that you have of the cost effectiveness book. And Patrick and I and Clive, Clive's going to be a co-author of the third edition. So we're working on that. And we can also benefit from feedback for, for that book. Well, what do I want to say? Brooks asked me to, to talk about the background for the way we look at the world and the work that we do. Um, it's a lonely background in the sense that very few people do cost effectiveness, cost benefit analysis, not just in education, but in many other areas. Uh, now, we can talk sometime this week about health. There's a lot more work done in health. There's a lot more money 
and health. Um, it's not an ideal field if you want to look at the work. It's basically, they do more subjective analysis in the cost-effectiveness work, and they spend a lot less time on looking at costs than we would like to see. Often, for example, they'll talk about an, a new procedure, and then they'll go to the business office of the hospital and say, how much did it cost? And those people in the hospital, first of all, prices are administered. They're not market prices in a hospital. Uh, and so that raises questions of what the cost data they get mean in the first place. But people in those offices don't have a clue what it is if you're talking about cost per procedure. What would the market cost be for a procedure? Um, what would the shadow price of a procedure be given that you have administered prices? And those are things that we can go into. Certainly Clive is going to handle those. So m mere volume of studies does not necessarily mean that they have it down and we can go there. We, we've been quite disappointed actually in looking at the health studies, even though the health literature is voluminous for one obvious reason huge amount of money in that sector uh, for, for this kind of analysis. So let me just run through this and uh, give you some idea on the background. Well, I've already said that, but look, we have the flags of um, people other than the states um, who are working with us, who have worked with us. Uh, in some cases, as I've mentioned, we've worked together for 15 or more years. Miyako Ikeda has been at the OECD and has been the principal analyst for P PISA. And uh, I worked with her for at least 12 years. So we're, we're, we're a team and uh, we feel really comfortable working together and, and open to suggestions that you have, okay? Uh, these are the names of our team members. Uh, you're going to see every one of them. Uh, Emma Garcia will be here on Thursday uh, to make a presentation. And Patrick, the co-author of this version of the Cost Effectiveness book and continued co-author of the third edition will be here as well. Okay, And uh, Emma is from this tricolor. That, well, it's really only two colors, isn't it? the uh, red and the yellow flag. So these are, uh, we don't have Barbara here right now, but she's from Chile. And so we work with an international group and they're just a wonderful, wonderful group to work with. Okay, context and history. Our Center for Benefit Cost uh, Studies in Education is not very old. It was established in 2007. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk to you goes back before that particular center was established and goes through a series of centers uh, at another university, Stanford University, where, where I was for 31 years. Um, but it's really a continuous history. We remind you that we work with two primary tools. We talk about four. Uh, we talk about cost utility analysis. We'll say something about that. A lot of the healthcare work, when they talk about qualities, a, uh, a quality adjusted life year, uh, that's also a form of utility analysis. Even though they put values on it, then they tell you, well, that's worth 50,000. Other people say, no, nah, it's worth 100,000. Uh, it's pretty, the numbers can get pretty soft. But um, cost utility analysis is a subjective approach in which you use values to look at the outcomes and to weight them and you compare those with the costs and you do that of course for a range of alternatives. We're not really going to focus on that in this training. And then cost feasibility analysis which is a straight cost analysis to look at alternatives in terms of whether given the resources available they're feasible to consider. Um, cost effectiveness, again, we remind you, 
refers to comparisons, in this case of educational alternatives, with the same goals to determine which have the largest effects relative to cost. So you, you're dealing on the effectiveness side with whatever criterion and metric you want to consider. Could be reading scores, could be graduation rates. You can just, just uh, decide what those things are. Of course, you need the same metrics for different studies, and that's going to be a problem that we're going to talk about, I think, on Wednesday. Uh, but it will come out again and again. And benefit cost studies are comparisons of uh, educational alternatives in terms of the cost and monetary value of benefits. And the first criterion is do the benefits exceed the cost? And the second one is um, by what magnitude? The mere fact that alternatives have benefits that exceed the cost is not sufficient criterion for selecting alternatives, and we'll, we'll be going into that. Okay, I want to talk to you about quickly about the history of each of these tools. Um, benefit cost analysis has its origins in the 1930s. Uh, during the Great Depression, Congress passed the Water Resources Act. And the purpose of the Water Resources Act was the idea that if we have major infrastructural improvements in the country, it will not only generate more employment, but it can do great things. It can reduce flooding, flood control, it can increase electric production, electricity production, rural electrification, which all, all of these things happened. You can uh, reduce transport costs by creating ports that are can accommodate larger vessels and um, more shipments of freight in both directions. Uh, so this, all of these had one thing in common. They all dealt with water. So the Water Resources Act was passed. And um, then the Congress became inundated with proposals from around the country um, to dam rivers and create huge lakes and create hydroelectric power and potable water and recreational opportunities. And um, another project would be to address the ports, the uh, deepening of harbors, the dredging of channels and rivers and canals and things of that sort. And all of these made great claims for the benefits for the entire country even though they were highly regional and were desperate attempts to get investment by congressmen and, and senators, Congress people, that's what it should be, right? There were, there were a few women in those days. Um, but now you have a problem, because how do you make decisions with a limited national budget? And so the Congress then declared that the, the um, Corps of Army Engineers, Corps of Army Engineers would be responsible in those days for designing these projects and for executing them, for implementing them. And um, wow, they had such diverse outcomes, but the Congress said that they will not consider projects where it cannot be demonstrated that the benefits are at least equal to the costs. Now you have these very diverse outcomes that I mentioned. These are just some of them. Electricity, potable water, recreation, flood reduction, faster transport. So what do you do? Well, um, Congress asked the Corps of Army Engineers to set out a method for benefit and cost and to bring the results to the Congress to make recommendations, those that met the benefit cost criterion. Uh, we, we, would, we would say the minimal criterion. And um, what the Corps of Army Engineers did in a fairly crude way, but they did it, is they said, okay, we can value the benefits in terms of dollar values by looking at the value of potable water, electric power, reduction in flood damage, uh, reduced cost of transport, recreation, and so on. 
how do we do this? Well, we can use market prices. That turns out that that's not very satisfactory because in, for many of these out, outcomes, market prices either don't exist or are inappropriate. Um, the market is unrepresentative. For example, if you provide enormous increases in electric power in a particular region, what, what does it mean to talk about the cost per kilowatt hour? First of all, you're going to increase the supply immensely. In areas where there's no electrification, you don't even have a base price in the existing market. So th this was actually um, something that stimulated economists to estimate what they believed the market prices would be over a period of time. So it was project development, then they had to discount future benefits, discount future costs to come up with some kind of benefit cost study that took account of the fact that there weren't market prices for most of these outputs. And, and they began to work on it during that period. Um, in education, a form of benefit cost analysis was established in the 60s through uh, investment in human capital and analysis of the rate of return on investment in human capital. And I think as most of you know, that particularly with the, um, with, with the publications and the attention provided this by people like Gary Becker, like T.W. Schultz, both who received Nobel Prizes largely for this work. Um, this became uh, an industry and really established the field of economics of education. And by the 70s, we start to see studies that include the impact of education on productivity, tax revenues, health, public assistance, um, reduction in criminal uh, activity and the cost of a criminal justice system. So this leads to work that's, that's more varied. By the 80s, Clive can answer questions on the work that he's done on this. But um, this analysis is applied to particular programs, and especially early childhood education, Perry Preschool, the Abbasidarian, and Chicago Child and Parents. And since then, it's been applied to many, many uh, preschool or early childhood programs. Now, cost-effectiveness analysis was strictly developed for the military, Department of Defense, this is an interesting paper by Ed Quaid, um, written in 1961, by the way, in which he traces this out. And the kinds of problems that they were challenged to face was this, that weapon systems, remember what uh, Eisenhower said about the military industrial complex. So the weapon systems that were being proposed were increasingly sophisticated and costly, very expensive. And so RAND and, and some other groups as well, Central Center for Naval Analysis, were challenged to compare different weapons approaches. And this really hit uh, or started to accelerate with the Korean, what do they call Korean conflict? There was no Korean War. There was a Korean, what was it called? Just a conflict, okay. Yeah, so the, I saw the football players fighting with each other towards, towards the end of the game last night, so kind of like Korea, right? Okay. Um, but the question is, would larger numbers of less expensive fighter planes be equivalent or superior to relatively few sophisticated fighters with all kinds of uh, avionics and, and missiles and things like that. And uh, so they would have simulations. Uh, ag again, I worry about the language, but they would call them war games uh, and simulations from actual battles. And then they would compare the numbers of kills, for example, per dollar, uh, using different strategies, different weapon systems. They did this with tanks as well. Um, so that, that was the origin. And I guess what we've tried to do is to, um, to uh, 
turn swords into plowshares by saying, well, you know, we might want to use this for things other than warfare. So um, what we see is benefit-cost analysis migrated to capital-intensive projects such as transportation, public works, still uh, infrastructural types of applications beyond what was being done in education in, in terms of um, rate of return analysis. But the uh, Department of Defense put in a whole group of uh, a, a whole department, really huge department, called the WizKids, and this was under Robert McNamara. Um, and they were very sophisticated. They used various kinds of algorithms, operations research approaches, and so on. But bottom line was cost-effectiveness analysis of different strategies, weapon systems, and so on. In the late 60s and early 70s, we start to see these techniques in human services, such as health, education, criminal justice, and the environment. But the tools were not very well developed. It's quite interesting that those who do evaluation are very fussy about the identification problem, about measurement, about a whole range of things. But when it comes to cost, they ask Jack in the business office, what, is this, what do these things cost? And Jack doesn't even understand the question in their terms or in the terms that they should be asking. Jack only interprets that in terms of the budget, which is going to be very misleading. I, I, I can guarantee it. So um, in, in fact, I characterized it in the words of a uh, colleague of mine, Lee Shulman. He applied this to something else. What we do is to measure effects, we use micrometers. And to measure costs, we use witching rods. Do you know what witching rods are? No? Okay, some of you don't. When we look for water, we get a stick that has a fork in it. And when the stick starts to shake, water, we believe, is there for the asking. Okay? All right. Cost effectiveness in education. Uh, by the 1980s, the term was commonly used in education, but how was it used? Well, uh, Bill Kloon, who was at the University of Wisconsin, he's now retired, did a study in the late 90s, 1997, 1998, and he checked the Eric Clearinghouse. The Eric Clearinghouse had about 10,000 documents with cost effectiveness as a key word. 10,000 documents. I'm sure there are way more now. Um, he did an analysis of a sample of abstracts and then papers, a very large number of abstracts and then sampled papers, and he showed that most were simply rhetorical claims in the nature of my intervention is very cost effective. Whatever I'm writing about is cost effective. No more evidence than that. No analysis and no clear meaning. And he concluded that only 2% or fewer of the papers in the Art Clearinghouse had a credible attempt at uh, cost-effectiveness analysis. So now let me go in quickly to the development of our approach. I've been interested in this for a long time. And um, way back when, I, the, the year is on there, but again, you know, in the spirit of your confidentiality, I don't want anyone to mention that year, you know, that we've been doing it this long, but we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I did a study of teacher selection that, that was published that year in the Journal of Human Resources. And um, Rick Hanyashek, who's a close friend of mine, and we had done some work together on the Coleman data, uh, I took his results, which were in his dis doctoral dissertation, 1968, and he had found positive coefficients for teacher experience and verbal testability for uh, sixth graders in uh, math and in reading. So, but the question then is, in this fairly simple demonstration of cost-effectiveness analysis, if we want to improve results for students in terms of achievement, which of these strategies deserve priority? Uh, 
getting teachers with more experience, getting teachers with higher verbal testability. Um, for the first time, we had to use what we call the ingredients approach in terms of uh, prices. Uh, if you go to salary schedules, for example, you find nothing for verbal score, even though teachers in better paying positions tend to have higher verbal score. That's what we learned from the Coleman data. But the, the salary schedule, remember Jack with the little visor and the quill pen? Uh, Jack can't find it on the salary schedule, and so we don't pay more for verbal score. And experience, Jack does find on the salary schedule, and so Jack tells you we pay this much more for each year. Well, there's a problem there because that's not ceteris paribus. It's not, we're not holding other things equal. And if we're not paying enough for a master's degree, then more talented people are likely to leave. So that, that number is not really a, a, a pure price or anything like that. So what we did is, um, I, sh I should say what I did, because I don't want to blame Hanyashek on this. Um, we, I, editorially, we uh, ran earnings functions, in which we tried to take account of all that other stuff, you know, just using covariates in the same labor market as the results that we got for the schools. And we used, then, these are shadow prices of experience measured much more directly than a salary schedule and of a verbal score. And our findings were that the increase in teacher verbal score is 10 times more cost effective for raising student achievement for blacks and five times more cost effective for whites than more teacher experience. And the conclusion is that we ought to pay some attention to trying to find teachers with higher ability rather than just looking for more experience, more experience with these particular characteristics set at the mean. Um, of course, no one listened. And today it's quite interesting because uh, I think this is very compatible with all this work that's going on today. Uh, it, it suggests that teacher ability is certainly, relatively speaking, more effective. And I think that if we were to price it out properly using even more sophisticated earnings functions, we would, we would find that this is sustained. Um, but in the early 70s, effectiveness studies were very limited. They were, they were, there were some experimental studies, but these became classics in the literature because there were so few. And there was some quasi-experimental evidence, but serious identification problems. And the costs, the conceptualization and measurement from study to study were, were inconsistent with cost criteria, and they relied heavily on budgets. And there was little attention to differentiating the total cost from who pays the cost. Um, so I really decided that this is something I wanted to work on. And um, at that time, very different times than we have today, there was a select Senate committee on equal educational opportunity headed up by Senator Mondale at the time, eventually Vice President Mondale. And there was interest in the next steps for civil rights and education. <coughs> and so Mondale was very, very concerned he said, you know, our witnesses constantly tell us that uh, the investments we make now will have very large payoffs in other ways. And so I was foolish, but he asked me to, to, to do a study. When I say I was foolish, the data that were available in those days were quite different than the ones that are available now. I think, as you know, every one of you probably has a smartphone that's more powerful than the largest mainframe computers that exist in those days, much more powerful and has much more memory and you don't have to have a little fan to cool it off, okay? Um, 
Nevertheless, foolishly, I uh, tried to make some assessment of, uh, the in of, of what the benefits would be of increased high school graduation in those days. By the way, if you had told me 45 years later that high school graduation would still be a challenge for this country, I would have told you wrong. I'm defining adequate education at that time as high school completion. And th this is something that will be resolved over time, over a relatively short period of time. Well, it turns out it wasn't uh, resolved. But anyway, we estimated the cost of increasing high school graduation relative to the benefits of the gains and income tax revenues and reductions in health costs, criminal justice costs, and public assistance for the Select Senate Committee. And we concluded that the public benefits were at least twice the public costs. But data and methodological work were needed to improve the estimates for BC and CE evaluations. So this was just an early study that took us in a direction that I thought was, was the appropriate direction, but not buttressed by the quality of data and analytic techniques that we really needed. Um, and that made, made me start to realize that we, we just, people just, when they did work in this area, they used their own criteria. Nothing was really comparable. And some of the stuff was demonstrably inappropriate, wrong, misleading. So I began to think about this and made some notes. And then I was asked, um, I was relatively young in those days, by the way, and I had hair down to here, maybe here, uh, which means, you know, that you take a lot of risks. I mean, how do you even get tenure, you know, and demonstrating about Vietnam and all that stuff. So I was really surprised when I was asked to put together a chapter for that first handbook of evaluation research on cost effectiveness in evaluation research. And that was a great experience for me because it forced me to go through each, in a sense, challenge each step and to try to come out with some solutions. And in 1975, we published that in the handbook. It uses opportunity cost as a basis for cost measurement, and it introduces the ingredients method as the approach that's transparent and clear and, and can be used to measure opportunity cost. So it established a method for measuring cost and the distribution of the cost burden among payers and then, of course, no one noticed it or cared about it, but at least, you know, it was one of the chapters in the, in the book. Um, I and colleagues then began to work with it on specific studies. The first edition of this cost-effectiveness book that we sent to you um, was published in 1983 and set out a comprehensive method. And here's something interesting to me. There were 13 uh, printings of that volume but no one used it, you know, so it, mu it must, it may be, look carefully at the first edition because it may have been that that cover really sold, okay, the aesthetics of the cover, <laughs> think about that. Um, the second edition was with Patrick McEwen and this incorporated the advances that had come along on experimental and quasi-experimental effects at that time and the third edition were kind of working on, trying to work on. Uh, during this period, this period from uh, really late 70s to today, we have published, and, and you'll find these, they're CBCSE authored, you'll find them on our website. We've done studies on computer-assisted instruction, peer tutoring, class size, length of the school day, Dropout Prevention, Early Childhood Literacy, Socio-Emotional Learning. That report will be out very shortly. Uh, it's a benefit-cost analysis. Uh, lectures versus small group instruction, Clive's work, Educational Technology, the work of uh, Fiona especially, Educational Vouchers, uh, Adolescent Literacy. So we've 
try to apply this to quite a lot of different topics. And that's been fun because you have to learn about those topics in order to apply it. So uh, we're curious and, and we learn. Um, and then uh, those were the CE, the cost effectiveness studies. We've done benefit cost studies on the value of increasing high school graduation nationally and also for California, Connecticut, Minnesota, and um, California again. Well, I like California, so we did it twice, I guess. Uh, but that should be Colorado. Colorado. Okay. Uh, early childhood education, national service, opportunity, youth. These are our people. It's a problem around the world in all, every country. Uh, people between the age of 16 or 18 to 24 who are neither working, studying, or training. Um, the social and emotional learning, comprehensive school services, nutrition, a number of different areas. And we've used this ingredients method, which we're going to share with you. Um, when it first came out, let's say in 1975, it was ignored. When it came out in 1983, it was largely ignored, except for my relatives and friends. Um, but today it's become pretty widely accepted. Um, it's recognized by the National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine in a re recent publication. Uh, it's been adopted by the j -Pal, uh Poverty Lab at MIT for experimental studies. Not always done in the way we would do it, but that's okay. First step is to recognize the method in itself as one way uh, that, that it really meets the criteria for measuring costs. And uh, you'll hear more about this later in the week. We developed a computer-based cost tool, which in itself is based on the method which will be introduced in the training, and, and you'll get gain access to it for your own work. They have to do, sign away their lives, don't they? <laughs> They've all already received it. Yeah. Okay. So what are the goals of the training? Well, we want to share what we've learned. Uh, are we imparting perfection to the world? No, we're not. A lot of things that we do, we try and then we critique ourselves. Or other people critique us. And we then go back to the drawing board and try to improve it. So. I think it's more a way of thinking, a way of measuring, a way of presenting results, and the ability to say, this is, this is good economics. It's not just ad hoc. It's not just, oh, costs. Uh, you know, what does, it mean to, what does that mean to me? Um, we want to provide guidance to you on your projects. That's part of what we proposed to the IES. We don't know how that's going to work. Um, on the last day, we're going to meet with small groups, four or five people, and you can write down some notes because we, we want to hear about your projects and we want others in your group. But we'll try to organize them in projects that have some affinity with each other. And um, we're going to try to follow up. What we can't do, of course, is be consultants on your projects. We don't have the resources and we'll be planning another training and trying to get our own work done. But what we can do is take the investment that we've made in, in cost effectiveness, cost benefit, and share it with you as it applies to your project and comment on your projects. 